Hello, my name is Adam Bean and welcome to the 74th edition of Airhex TV. And let's start with the very first question. And uh, I had a chat with John Klingen uh, from Red Hat and we um, about uh, memory requirements for enterprise applications and and Quarkus and um, and larger companies. And um, what I got uh, an idea or an observation is um, that actually a larger companies they care a lot about RAM and in some cases they try to ship uh, production software which runs on fraction of CPUs or RAM so they are very uh, I would say uh, they try to save as much resources as possible um, I also work with uh, startups and the, and the funny th thing is that the startups don't care that much about uh, RAM and CPU consumption because um, it is actually cheap. So, and um, if you see directly the costs, it actually does not matter a lot if you are not Netflix or uh, GitHub, right? And um, so, what um, actually means that if you are a startup, you could actually fully focus on uh, productivity and uh, just go fast without, you know, uh, sp uh, spending too much time thinking about whether, you know, you should uh, you should save uh, a gig RAM or not, and. Uh, and you could actually compete with l larger companies because they have you know, to think about uh, uh, cost savings and uh, potentially you, um, you are faster in production. So um, um, time, to, uh, time to going live is shorter uh, because uh, you don't have to spend too much time for optimization. So just an interesting observation I wanted to, to, to uh, share with you and uh, yeah, just got before the show. So now... Um, now to the questions, and um, the very first question is uh, from a friend of the show, actually an alumni from um, from Airhex.com at the Munich Airport, and he asked me, uh, 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 thanks for your latest Airhex I.O. with Web Components workshop, on what he means is, and I get a couple of questions, so there is a, a recent uh, workshop, Web Components with Redux and um, Lit HTML, which is live now, and um, uh, with um, Airhex, um, with Airhex IO twenty, you get twenty percent off. And um, and the uh, this is uh, the the latest, I would say, the latest iteration of the workshops. And I try to answer even more questions, and I try to build a semi complicated application. And um, what I forgot to mention during the um, the uh, the uh, workshop. What I actually did is uh, it's called um, state-based applications because the entire state of the application or the entire view from the application um, is uh, reconstructed from the state in the Redux. So I, I forgot to mention the buzzword during the show, but now it's done. And um, so this is the uh, web components with Redux. It's also accessible from my blog. So if you click on this button, you will you will see this. And um, so and um, Ulf asked me. Um, uh, I know you most often use Docker in production for backend, but for the front end, do you use any web server like Apache or Nginx? So um, he, he, you ask me. So my what I do on right now on my server, I still use Apache for historical reasons. So I used Apache from the year two thousand, I think. So I just upgraded, um, and it works. So the the um, configuration is relatively simple. I don't use too much modules. Except uh, mod proxy for uh, HTTP routing, and uh, I'm using behind the Apache. Uh, I have uh, two um, multiple Quarkus microservices, multiple Payara and Whitefly micro Whitefly microservices or services, and uh, some Tommy microservices. This is the only thing which I don't have now is Open Liberty because uh, everything works uh, because everything was installed before. Open Liberty was available, and uh, the uh, newer microservices are Quarkus. So, if you're registered to EHX Live, for instance, the registration service is a Quarkus service right now. And I ported that from uh, a Jakarta e application, um, which used mod JK, and now I use mod proxy, which is like HTTP proxy. So, and but this is you ask me what I'm doing. So, this is my pr private server, and for my clients, we mostly use HA proxy. Directly or indirectly. So on OpenShift, this is HA proxy without knowing it. So this is the the proxy, and um, and but in OpenShift it actually does not matter because on OpenShift the um, HA just serves the routes, the HTTP. It exposes an IP address via HTTP. So um, and now 
uh, what we do. So in one startup, we misuse Quarkus as a web server. So we ship the entire, the entire, all the assets, CSS, JPEGs, HTML, the static stuff, JavaScript. We package this to uh, with uh, Quarkus and Quarkus without any Java code inside, and we create a native bundle, so native compilation, and we ship this file to production because easy. And the backend is just regular Quarkus app. This is uh, one case. In other cases, we are using Nginx, a static HTTP server, so mostly Nginx, and uh, and then Quarkus on the backend. And in some projects, we use, uh, for instance, Payara as a HTTP server and as a as a backend service. So there's some overhead, but this is, uh, I don't know, 100 megs of RAM, so it does not matter a lot. Um, yeah, just remember what I said before. So it actually does not matter on paper, but this is a uh, sometimes it, it matters in meetings. So, um, yeah, and uh, do your front end inside Docker container. And actually, I always, so I, I would say in the recent three years, everything runs in a container and uh, it doesn't have to be Docker, but usually it is. Uh, so in Kubernetes, this is container D. So it looks like Docker, but it isn't Docker. So for me, I, I, I just say, I use Docker everywhere, and sometimes it is just you know the doc, uh, container D runtime. So what's the difference? Um, this is a, a similar difference. As if I say I uh, know um, I'm using Java everywhere, and what it actually means sometimes I use OpenJDK and sometimes Oracle Java, and, and in other cases the Zulu Java from Azul Systems, and someone uh, sometimes Java from from Red Hat. And this is the uh, like Docker is a vendor which implements a spec con con uh, called container D. And um, yeah, this is so. Actually, Docker is uh, is always Docker, and I can't remember anymore when I used something on bare metal. Um, so usually, it's always Docker. So now, this was uh, Ulf. Now Alex Nerd, nice name, Alex. So um, thank you. And uh, he asked me. I recently bought the Effective Web Standards course, so you should also buy the the uh, next one uh, called uh, the. Um, now it's called Web Components with Redux and Lit HTML. And um, by the way, um, also, I actually was not involved in, in Twitter recently. Uh, there's also a friend of the show, Guru. This is actually, this is the nicest uh, name e uh, ever. So the Java Guru, the, the, the one and only Java Guru. Um, he said um, he had some ar arguments with the other guys. And uh, I had no time to arguing with them, but... There was the assumption that the browser sync only reloads the entire thing. And, uh, oh, this was the Niklas Lohschmidt. He said um, that uh, we are just cobbled technologies together to create a framework, which is somehow true. But um, what I um, what I uh, use in the Web Components workshop is uh, Web Components Redux, which is basically one JavaScript file, and lit HTML, which was a JavaScript file, now has multiple files, and this basically was, so there's not like cobbling technologies together. And with Browser Sync, Browser Sync replaces uh, CSS independently and, and all the files independently, and we could actually modularize that. So um, wh where, where I'm going with that, I hear often the arguments that uh, web components or custom elements are not supposed to be like an application or not meant for building application rather than for finer grained components, which is not my observation. So we use uh, web components to structure entire applications, and so far everyone was happy. So, um, okay, but back to the question. He asked me, um, and uh, so and he loves uh, likes my effective web standards. Um, so and he asked me, but th there are four courses exclusively about the front end, and the last uh, back end course about four years ago was about a uh, back end. Now the question is, um, what happens uh, next? So the next one is going to be about back end. I'm uh, uh, it it um, I, I will build an application again and um, the application is one of the applications I will actually use in production for myself so it was going to be more or less real life for me or real world for me and um, Quarkus um, I think Quarkus could be too specific and um, we had uh, Ehex Live uh, workshop uh, two days ago just about uh, Quarkus and MicroProfile so I think I will go with Jakarta and MicroProfile both technologies for instance and I try to answer this here 
So now, next one, Glitch Cube. Uh, I recently bought, uh, thank you for buying. By the way, this apps with web components, Redux and Lit HTML was already shipped or downloaded to over 20 countries, which is amazing. And uh, feedback was actually uh, good so far. So I really um, nicely surprised that this was well received um, because uh, I think it is unusual in JavaScript, you know, to, to say you don't need any frameworks. <laughs> so, um, uh, and he liked, uh, so, uh, shame on GlitchCube because he haven't watched through the uh, whole course. I mean, there were just 110 episodes and five hours. So you could actually, you know, uh, watch it at uh, at once with, with double speed in two hours and you are done. <laughs> just kidding. So, but I like the, the use of Snowpack. So, and he um, he attended my workshop in December. So I really enjoyed, by the way, the uh, the last uh, uh, airhex.com on Airport Munich in December. And I used Rollup and now I use uh, Snowpack. So Snowp Snowpack uses also Rollup behind the scenes. With uh, Rollup, you have a little bit more, a little bit more control what you can do. And Snowpack is a little bit more convenient. So what Snowpack does is you can uh, create an NPM project and uh, Snowpack will transform all the uh, dependencies in NPM into uh, ES6 modules. And with Rollup, uh, you will have point Rollup to, uh, to, to, to a starting file. So this is the main difference. And actually during the course, I just wanted to make something different because uh, I, um, I already recorded, I think the last workshop with Rollup. And I said, okay, this time I can show something else. And uh, whether we are using Rollup, uh, Snowpack, or uh, prior to this, it was PikaDev, it actually does not matter because um, this build process is completely separated from the developers. So we create the bundles on, for instance, on Jenkins once, and then we are just consuming the ES6 module. So I'm a little bit uh, no more... Um, I'm a little bit more lenient with the build tools because uh, what only matters, the output is standard. It can be consumed by, by, by uh, any browser without any additional tooling. Okay, Albert PA says, in BC pattern, in which package should you put microprofile register as client interfaces and why? For me, uh, uh, the uh, so what is register as client? Register as client is an interface which is automatically implemented by uh, by the microprofile runtime. So let's say um, you have the uh, Airhex Live uh, web page and you would like to fetch the content. So you have an interface. Uh, you can name it as you like. Let's say Airhex Live, and then you have to put a register as client or not. Yeah, I think register as client interface on it. Uh, yeah, um, annotation on it with uh, either base URL or uh, a key. I think it's called something like key. And uh, and then uh, the key is resolved with microprofile config to an URI. And then uh, if you put get annotation on a method of the interface, and let's say string as a result, it will automatically be implemented by calling the, the, the resource and, and transforming the result into string. You can, of course, have response. So where to put it? In control, of course. Why that? Because for me, it is like a proxy of a real service. And uh, this is for me is a control. So I would have a resource. Uh, the resource will call a uh, service, which uh, calls multiple controls. And one such a control would be a call to an external service. And for me, uh, so from the architectural point of view, register as client interface uh, is uh, similar to, let's say, DAO pattern is not needed, but if you would access, let's say, a um, NoSQL database, this would be the same level or the same abstraction. Nice. Now, thank you, Albert. Now to Venue2. To test RESTful web servers, we use separate projects to implementing system tests, which is very good. Um, how to measure code coverage in this scenario? So with with Jacoco works actually with with all runtimes, and I would put the Jacoco agent to the main module and just run the system test in another module, and then you get your code coverage file uh, called Jacoco.exec, and then you can consume the uh, the file from your IDE or uh, how it's called, no Nexus uh, Sonar, and um, yeah, and you have your uh, your uh, statistics. Could you recommend best practice for implementing Open API documentation? I actually read the question today morning, and I th thought about a lot because it's a very good question. And for me, this Open API, uh, there's 
there are similar approaches or approaches, similar best practices to Javadoc. And, um, and but uh, this is, uh, by the way, uh, Adam being Javadoc, how to comment. I showed this post several times because uh, I got this from someone and um, as an via email, I think, and he said, uh, so what is in the name, the how in the code, and the why in the comment? So the what was in the name of the resource, for instance, or in the signature of the HTTP resource, uh, it means, you know, get uh, clients, it should be get clients, so you don't have to code us. How to get them, you could, for instance, uh, document with uh, curl commands, which are sometimes even generated from OpenAPI, and uh, why in the comment, this would be the additional, additional information in the OpenAPI. So um, this was the brief, uh, brief answer, but uh, that's not, not all. For me, the open API should be treated as an additional user interface. Um, and the question is then, you know, who is actually the, uh, the actor which is interested in the open API interface? So uh, who will consume open API? The same team, another team of developers, complete different company. Is it an uh, API? So if you are publishing your service to the internet, it, it 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 could be even you know your main API. So imagine a payment service like a uh, PayPal or something like this. I mean the the open API would be the main user interface. So you can spend you know endless amount of time just to make it as great as possible to uh, to appeal to developers because this is your main se selling point. So before we can answer this, you, you should actually ask the, uh, the question, you know, who will consume the open API and what is the, the purpose of it? But my expectation would be, if you, uh, if you look at the open API and on, on the um, uh, API with additional open API description, you should be able to write immediately the client, uh, the client and knowing you know, how, to, how to use the client. And it should be added value. So if you if you can go away just with the REST interfaces, so sometimes the REST interfaces are that great, so you don't need any documentation. So then I wouldn't would not write any open API documentation. And sometimes I have the feeling that the developers are forced to write open API uh, description just to have a documentation, which was exactly like with Javadoc, where developers were forced to, to doc document all public interfaces or public methods. With, uh, and no one read the documentation and this was just, you know, this is a getter, this is a setter, and this is a constructor, and this is to string. And now what I see is you now uh, uh, get clients, returns clients, and uh, 500 is internal server error. This is like the, the quality of most open APIs, which are not most, the majority of open APIs I see in the wild. So yeah, each developer writes documentation to the uh, API yeah, and I think um, then what should happen is another team consumes the open API and they should be able to uh, to to uh, to write the, the clients for it. Perfect. Dempile, also friend of the show, so I, I read the Dempile over and over again. Um, how are you doing well and staying at home to do more nice stuff about Java as usual? <laughs> um, Hope, yeah, uh, this is uh, this is true. So I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit more productive because uh, I don't have to travel. Um, but uh, what I um, over how to now what I overestimated is the amount of, of time I will gain with the current situation, and uh, and uh, the time just flies. And I thought, you know, I will achieve everything in shortest of amount of time. So a little bit disappointed, but um, I'm really happy. So um, with the productivity. And um, yeah, now the question is three questions. I'm trying to cluster Payara full in OpenShift with discovery mode Kubernetes with Payara S2I image. Um, and he struggles to make it work. When I scale to two instances, the second doesn't find the Hazelcast data grid. Uh, it said it worked with Payara S2I micro, which is interesting. So it works with micro, but not uh, S2I, but not the full. As I remember, both, um, I think the S2i micro is based on the S2i, so both have to work actually exactly the same. What could be that um, the uh, S2i um, full, wait a second, what doesn't work? It worked great with S2i micro, okay, and not with full. Uh, 
maybe there are different pores exposed. I don't know it uh, exactly, but um, uh, what I can tell you, both uh, S2I images are nearly identical. And uh, what surprises me that the Payara S2i works better than the S2i because the micro I image I built uh, afterwards and I didn't test it as much as the full because I used full more than the micro. I just created the micro. Big I actually forgot why. I Someone asked me about that or a, a client wanted to test it. So I just, uh, but we used this in production and we didn't use this S2i micro in production. Um, so, and you have to be careful. For instance, my machine, um, the, uh, the headlands, uh, sorry, headlands, the um, Hazelcast only works uh, in case uh, I disable my uh, screen sharing functionality. There's the same port on Mac. So I don't know what, which operating system you are running. This could be also an issue that um, uh, you're running in Minishift probably. And uh, yeah, you have some collisions with ports. I cannot actually boot Payara with screen sharing on, on my machine, which is known issue. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, what could also be that there is a bug in one of the images and I forgot, you know, to expose a port. This would be the easiest explanation. So question number, uh, the second question is when using a bulkhead, is it suitable to put application scoped or request scoped? Uh, it's also a very good question. Uh, actually, this is an excellent question because what bulkhead does um, is it limits the amount of threats. Now, uh, request scoped means we have for every request an instance. Application scope means we have one instance. So uh, from uh, from the bulkhead perspective, it does not matter a lot. Usually, if you have bulkheads, you try to say, you know, I have one resource and this resource I would like to uh, protect with bulkhead uh, because I don't like, you know, to have more than five or ten uh, concurrent connections. And uh, and the last Airhex Live, uh, we had the conversation that um, in, in one particular project, uh, we were not allowed to have more than 10 connections, and then we can set bulkheads to protect the resource. In this particular case, I think application scope makes more sense. And uh, request, um, but if, the only difference is you have to be a little bit more careful with application scope about uh, the shared state. Um, yeah. So how to prevent multiple calls to the same endpoint in order to, to that the application will not slow down or crash? This is um, actually Bulkhead's um, uh, uh, functionality. And there are multiple possibilities. If you have JAXRS, um, take a look on, on my microservice workshop or at least uh, AHEX.io, the, the, the repository you will find completable future examples. So you can use completable future with uh, injected thread pool, for instance. You could use, uh, you could use um, bulkheads. What you can also use, you could, uh, you could use uh, internal thread pools from application servers, and this even works with Quarkus. It also uh, comes with internal thread pools. So um, I hope this is clear, but before you do this, just test that, you know. Because um, this makes more sense for larger microservices. If the microservice is smaller, usually what can happen is uh, you are, you know, the main res resource. So if you, if you die, everything dies. So there is nothing to share. So then bulkheads ma makes less sense. So it really depends how big your microservice actually is. So the uh, the uh, Sebastian Dash, a friend of the show, and um, he he what surprised me took a look at the uh, Web Components workshop, which uh, is strange because Sebastian is a Java hacker and he starts now to enjoy JavaScript for unknown reasons. I think Sebastian works for IBM and Sebastian has too much time you know, for, for, <laughs> for investigation. So just kidding. So, um, so and uh, also a great question. Um, he, uh, he, he likes the, the idea of structuring with BCE, the frontends. Um, so what I did in the course, I used boundary control entity, the same, the same structure what I use in the, in the backend. And by the way, this BCE comes from the frontend. And uh, it was, uh, we use it, you know, uh, a long time ago for swing applications, stuff like that in the frontend, then moved to the backend. And now we use it again in, in, in JavaScript. And... Um, so and 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 what he doesn't like uh, the the idea of reducers. So what re what reducers are are functions which are manipulating the uh, singleton state. So um, the um, application I created in the in the workshop. Um, uh, this was the events application. This was the um, the following uh, the following structure. 
So there was a web component, a front end, let's say, a date input. And the date input, you could write, you know, date. And, um, and then the date input uh, was, uh, there was an event handler, which says, for instance, on, on change. And uh, the text was passed to the control. This was a function. And this function uh, uh, got the text and transformed the text into an event. And the event was, uh, was distributed. And what happened behind the scene, it was, um, it was passed to Redux store. And in the Redux store, there was a, a switch case. And uh, uh, according to the event type, uh, uh, the logic uh, did something to the store. So it changed the state. And then all components were notified and lit HTML was in charge of finding uh, out what actually changed and rendered only the parts of the application who changed. And, and, and Seb Sebastian says, OK, the reducer, the reducer is like you know the piece which uh, manipulates the state in the Redux store. Um, why it is an entity? And my thinking was, um, my thinking was that the uh, that the Redux store, the entire store, uh, actually uh, represents uh, our entities in the backend. So uh, usually you would have you know events entity, and we would have uh, author blog post uh, comments entity. And uh, in the Redux cases, everything is this one Redux, but with slots. So there's one huge singleton, like a hash map, and the keys of the singletons are the nouns of the entities. So, and the reducer, what a reducer is, it manipulates the state. And for me, in domain-driven design, uh, we would have one Java Pojo with the state, and reducer would be methods of the state. So this is why I think that the reducers belong somehow to the entity. Um, I, I don't think you know it would be entirely wrong to 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 put the reducers into the control package, but uh, for me it was cleaner to th the following thinking: the uh, components only or the UI user interface, the widgets, are only allowed to communicate with controls. Controls transform the user input, and this is exactly how it was defined in BCE pattern boundary control entity. So the controls just receive you know the user interactions, transform it in the events. So Sebastian, look it up. I think it's called robustness diagrams in the old books from Butch or whatever. So this is how it was described. And um, so, and then the events are processed, and this processing is a little bit you know with Redux are different. But uh, in in the case of uh, of Swing, we would have uh, there you know our actual business logic. So um, exactly what he did, what he what he uh, would like to have is reducers and dispatches in the control package. I think. Um, you could have both. Uh, so in my thinking, it's more like domain-driven design, just like you know panache in uh, in Quarkus. So the entity has you know reducer would be you know the static methods on the entity, and uh, and the state is the entity itself. So this was my thinking here. And if you think if you would like to put the reducers and dispatches in the control package, it's more like service-oriented or microservices thinking where the entities are dump, and the controllers have the logic. So perfect. Uh, and then next question from Sebastian is one or more on front-end architecture. Uh, Redux examples model a new event created, which with Redux constraints reminds me a lot of CQRS, what it is exactly. Um, so I don't know what the question is. It's more about intentions. Create new event, new event created. Um, it is about my naming, right? So what I did is new event created and create new event. Um, I don't... What I can tell you in one project, what we did, which was actually great, Sebastian, so uh, was exactly the same architecture from the workshop with the difference. Uh, we had Kafka in the backend. And uh, in this particular case, if you think about this, so we uh, our controllers emitted events and the events were sent to the backend via JAXRS. In JAXRS, we just uh, wrote, transformed the event into a Kafka event. The event was uh, processed by multiple Kafka topics and process and process and process. And then on, on the way back, we transformed the, a, a Kafka event into a WebSocket event, which was received by all clients. And the thing, uh, what happened was uh, we uh, transformed then the event on the client, WebSockets event, into Redux action. Um, and uh, the Redux action was processed by Redux, which was great for debugging. So this was actually CQRS completely. Um, I have to probably review my way of naming and the Redux way of naming. And uh, yeah, 
So this is uh, I was not uh, I just oh, um, I didn't read your your question here. So I have to think about it. Probably I will create uh, another video or uh, on the next AX TV. So. Um, I think you have to be just consistent and I think what I did in the workshop is what I usually do without thinking too much about that but uh, we try to be consistent with the Kafka naming I think this should be this is more important than the Redux naming because Redux is just you could use Mobix or, or write you know Redux by yourself this is actually a simplistic framework actually we could something like Redux I think in Java you could implement in in a day so not a problem at all and uh, what I like is the uh, the naming from 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 Kafka or event streaming architectures. I think this what we what would be better. Okay, thank you, um, Dino Lupo. I know the guy from somewhere. Uh, so um, two questions: What is your opinion about the pros and cons of choosing Quaracus Spring or standard Java Jakarta E app server in an enterprise context? So um, Spring, I have no experience. Uh, what, let's say replace Spring with Micronode because there are some some questions about that. So let's say Quarkus Micronode or uh, Java or Jakarta App Server in an enterprise context. Um, so LTS stability and support continue are must. Yeah, and um, there will be a, a podcast upcoming about this topic. And um, for me, Quarkus, for instance. It's extremely fast-moving project with lots of extensions. So I think it is mission impossible that Red Hat or the community will support all the extensions forever. So some of the exceptions, uh, exception, ex exceptions, some of the extensions will die. It is like it is because there are too many. So um, so I think if you would like to have uh, LTS support in Quarkus, uh, what you should do is rely on standards. What, I st what are standards or semi-standards? So um, in the case of Quarkus, all you know Jakarta E APIs like JPA and all microprofile uh, uh, APIs ha should have precedence. Why? Because in case Quarkus dies entirely, you can you know take your code and move to Payara, Helidon, or other frameworks. But if you will re rely, let's say you are building Quarkus apps with React Reactive Vertex, but not microprofile with Panache. And Qt templates, and you just pick, you know, the proprietary extensions, and you won't use uh, microprofile at all, which I don't think is even possible because uh, at least you will have to use CDI. Um, in this particular case, uh, the chances are high that one of the extensions will die, and then you will have to migrate the stuff to something else, which is probably completely different to Quarkus. And this is my point also of Micronode. Micronode is very similar to Quarkus, but comes with own programming API. And means you have to learn it first. And with Quarkus, you can just go with microprofile, and then you can lower the risk. This is also the the um, the reason why uh, the migration from Jakarta e, from reasonable Jakarta e projects to Quarkus is so easy. Okay, so this is what I can tell you. And what I know is um, Red Hat provides a, a long-term support for Quarkus right now, so you can buy it, which is a very good sign. Okay. So uh, I've seen many times the behavior of running Spring in the full-blown Java e app, app server. Is that really a bad practice? Uh, or do you think there really could become hidden reasons for that? Um, I never got this. What I saw, but this is uh, it, it's a little bit less right now. What I saw, I would say, five to ten years ago, uh, the clients had WebSphere and run on top of WebSphere Spring. So they, they actually maintained two frameworks and... and, and and an architect claimed that this is like lightweight solution. It's like how two frameworks are, can be more lightweight than one. But uh, this is uh, um, also my observation. I don't get it. What I uh, um, in one project, um, what I uh, what I understood is they paid uh, support for the old WebSphere, and it was very expensive. And developers never gave feedback to the uh, to the um, operations. And operations thought, you know, WebSphere runs fine, and they never upgraded WebSphere. What uh, happened then is they, uh, they, 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 the WebSphere was never upgraded, so they had to use, I forgot, Java E5 or whatever. And they didn't want it to do, uh, to do that, so they used Spring to patch Java E5 in order to have more modern API. And, you know, the operation was still happy because a uh, developer never complained about this fact. So this could be a reason. So where you have, you know, an old application server and you cannot upgrade the application server for unknown reasons and you use you no know, third-party framework 
to make the uh, the development more enjoyable. Which, um, but what you get is more moving parts. In this particular project, you get all Spring annotations plus all Java E applications, so you need you know experts from both worlds. Um, so everyone says I'm an excellent ambassador. What uh, actually I try to do is uh, save time, and I still enjoy Java. So, but thank you that um, if I'm help helpful, um, nice. So yeah, service. So I'm currently implementing Debezium with Kafka. Nice. Uh, what Debezium is, you hook into usually Postgres or MySQL database, and it transforms uh, insert or table operations as a state changes in the table into Kafka events, and usually uh, it creates for every table a Kafka topic. So, um, and it uses micro-reactive messaging, looks really nice, yeah, it looks, and, uh, but I'm a bit confused about its place in microprofile. Um, I could find out that it's well supported in Quarkus, yes, um, I worked with that, and it worked out of the box, and, um, so will uh, reactive messaging to be uh, fully integrated into microprofile in any upcoming releases and applications that supports microprofile? Uh, um, and that support microprofile. So all application servers support microprofile. What we are talking about is the reactive extensions, and it is not an official part of the microprofile yet, but if you go to smallry.io and you go to the projects, you will find the reactive messaging. I think this is, I always confuse these operators with the messaging, but I think this is the right one. Uh, or it or isn't the right one. This is the right one, exactly. And um, so if you have this, um, if you would like to have this, this is this was actually, so what you can do, let's take a look. You could go here. Okay, let's say file. Reactive messaging. You should be able, this is what I never did with this particular part because I use, uh, you should be able actually to, to take this dependency, put it to an application server and patch the application server. The small right is more or less like a polyfill. And we patched the old JBoss with uh, metrics and health, I think. So, um, and it worked out of the box. I never tried this. So, in theory, it should be possible to point Payara to this uh, ship, the dependent, no, Payara, in your war, specify dependency to this module, pull the dependency, and then it could work out of the box. So, this would be uh, what I would try. And, uh, I had no time to look it up whether it is supported by Payara or not. And I think the Payara Kafka JCA connector has nothing to do with the reactive messaging and microprofile. They just uh, they have uh, additional Kafka implementation for Payara. And final words about Kafka. If you would like to use uh, Kafka, please use the um, the uh, Kafka Streams API, not the low-level producer consumer API. I don't think it is uh, really usable for enterprise projects. So it is, um, yeah, start with uh, Kafka Streams. TP ask me, Payara monitoring questions. Do I need to enable monitoring to be able to get statistics? Uh, it was the case. It depends on the, on, um, Take a look at the Lightfish project. It's my old Payara project with uh, monitoring. It could be helpful. Lightfish, like light and fish, uh, should even work with uh, recent Payara. Uh, so what you will have to do is you, yeah, uh, you. Uh, what I did back then, I had to do this. So uh, there is a possibility via the AMX to enable all the monitoring uh, GMX beans. So you have to enable JMX monitoring, and then you get all statistics. So what is the impact of on performance? So um, I measured this back then, and it was uh, very low. Uh, I always, we even back then, we were with the highest. So if you go to the admin console from Payara, you can um, set Payara to the highest monitoring levels. And we went with that into production and uh, and the difference was measurable, but as I remember, it was uh, at most 10% or something. So um, it was uh, uh, not a problem at all. Um, and with um, 
Prometheus is even lower because Prometheus will pull Pyara every five seconds or 10 seconds. So this is the actually performance hit. And just to gathering the metrics is not a big deal uh, for, uh, for Pyara. So, and uh, Rudy, I think his name is Rudy de Busche from, uh, from Payara, he created a functionality where you can pick whatever JMX bin you like and expose it as a, as a Prometheus matrix. Um, so this is really nice because what I wanted to have once in Payara is I, I wanted to measure the depth of the incoming request queue and expose it as a, uh, as a Prometheus or at a chat on DevOx, I think. And uh, Rudy uh, implemented that, which is really, really useful. Um, is there a better way compared to using JMX to get a monitoring statistic? For instance, REST monitoring interface just built in on top of JMX stack. This is already the case. So search for my own, on YouTube for uh, Adam Bean, Pyara Lightfish, and Pyara monitoring. I recorded a lot. I also wrote articles about that. And um, if JMX is, uh, if JMX is um, enabled in Pyara, you can go through the REST monitoring interface. You can gather the, matri met the metrics via JMX or recently via, via Prometheus. But there are always the same metrics. So let's see. Oh, I get on the fly new questions. If my EGB is thread safe, could I use singleton instead of stateless? If you use a singleton EGB, the EGB is still a thread. Uh, I wanted to say threadless, <laughs> thread safe, because what Singleton does, uh, it prevents the entire concurrency. So if you put at Singleton, EGB Singleton, on an EGB, there will be no parallel behavior at all. So what you will have to do is to put at Singleton and then concurrency management bean, and then you have the concurrent behavior. If not, what would be the main reasons not to do so? Uh, I mean, Singleton with concurrency management bean, you could do this. Right, and um, there was one investigation from Red Hat, but it was 10, 15 years ago, that stateless case better than uh, than uh, Singleton. And as I remember, the reasoning was because if you think about this, you have more parallel instances at the same time floating around, so you get something like more queuing in the system. And Singleton, there is only one, so this was the reasoning back then. So um, yeah. And uh, Singleton is a little bit more dangerous because you have cons uh, constantly you know, review the code and see whether there is shared state. And stateless is just uh, easier because you will immediately recognize that it doesn't work. Because the chances are lower that uh, two times in a row you will hit the same instance. So this is, this is the explanation. And uh, from the performance perspective, stateless is very, very similar to Singleton. So there's actually no reason to, to optimize. So uh, what are your thoughts about Hipster? G-A-D-N-T, ask me, what are, uh, uh, the Gabriel, uh, ask me, what are your thoughts about J-Hipster? I think J-Hipster is a code generator. I have no experience with J-Hipster. Um, I only knew a developer who recently who told me that uses J-Hipster, but didn't like that because it generated some too much code or whatever. Uh, I never used J-Hipster, so um, it's just, uh, yeah. I cannot give you any, you know, opinion about that. So, um, and um, and uh, thank you all for listening. Let's see what happens here. So, Dean Lupo, I, hi, Dino. And uh, the question is, you attended the Hex? I know your name from somewhere. So, uh, uh, you're a famous guy. Uh, what happens here? No questions. No questions. And the only thing about Hex Live, what I for forgot to mention is, um, the next AirHacks Live is about web components. It won't be the same as the uh, recorded version. This would be too boring for me. It is uh, like we will build something else, but with uh, Redux, lit HTML, a little, probably even lit, um, a bit more you know, updated uh, tooling. I mean, uh, this is uh, half a year later. And uh, yeah, this, if you like, you can register right now. And I will try to make it a little bit smaller. So. Um, the AHEX uh, live for the last was uh, this last week. It was from all over the world. It was actually great fun, and I was really surprised how well it worked. So um, I gave the attendees, uh, you know, the opportunity to introduce themselves, and the, the, the cool story is we were ready to go in 34 minutes, and all the headsets, everything worked. So this is unusual for 
and we had lots of fun. You know, the audience they 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 uh, exchange in chats. Uh, they um, links and uh, had uh, fun about the show. There were people from USA who started. You know. Uh, to, uh, to tuned in, I think it was on 2 a.m. Some guy from New Mexico, so it was uh, a lots of fun, and uh, yeah, I, I it, it worked well better th th than than I thought. So and yeah, this will be the next one, and if I have time, so probably sometimes something in between. Um, but uh, I cannot promise you now. Crazy times, uh, I get uh, lots of work to do, uh, more than actually expected. And yeah, thank you for watching. See you on upcoming conferences, AX Live, uh, or the um, uh, workshop about web components. And yeah, see you next month. Thank you and bye.